want to introduce Dr. Masa Javid, our new uh, uh, Von Rowan Professor of Endocrine Surgery. Dr. Javid is an endocrine surgeon, an outstanding, excellent uh, endocrine surgeon uh, with uh, a lot of research interest, and she's going to uh, be playing a major role in our uh, surgical oncology endocrine surgery program. Uh, stand up, take a bow, introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce to you Dr. Jamie Coleman. Uh, Dr. Coleman went to medical school at the University of Tennessee and then did her residency at uh, Rush University where she got her uh, initial trauma training at Cook County Hospital before she went off to Emory for uh, trauma critical care fellowship and then had faculty positions at Indiana University and most recently uh, University of Colorado before we were fortunate enough to be able to recruit her away to join our program uh, as uh, a vice chair of wellness in the Department of Surgery and in our trauma uh, acute care surgery critical care uh, program where she's associate professor. She has a lot of research interest in the area of um, surgeon and resident wellness and we're hoping to translate that into some wellness initiatives uh, that will have an impact for our uh, faculty and residents and fellows as well. Uh, Dr. Coleman has uh, uh, um, done a fantastic job already in her, her first uh, first year as a, as a trauma uh, attending here and uh, we really uh, look forward to your discussion today about social media. She's also a big expert on social media and uh, there's a lot of pitfalls here so pay attention this ought to be entertaining. haven't even started. This is a great audience. Great. Good morning. Welcome. All right. Social media and medicine. Are they friends or are they foes? All right. Anytime anyone gives you advice or tells you anything, they come from a perspective. That perspective contains bias. Mine is that I actively use social media. But today we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to actually define it. We do have a mixed range of experience likely in the audience with social media. We're gonna tell you maybe some interesting facts that you didn't know. In addition to that, I'm gonna share some stories with you all that actually illustrate the fact that whether you think media, social media and medicine belong in the same sentence or not, they already do exist in the same sentence. Describe the relationship between social media and our patients. What I'm gonna share with you today is whether or not you have a relationship with social media, the vast majority of your patients do. Or describe the relationship between social media, research, career advancement, and hopefully, at the very least, inspire you to acknowledge and maybe, maybe participate. Overall, definition, computer-mediated technologies that allow the creating and sharing of information, ideas, career interests, and other forms of expression via virtual communities and networks. And I really wanna highlight the word communities because that's actually what social media is about. And I think, depending upon your generation, we're all gonna have a seizure here in a minute. <clears throat> <laughs> no offense to that, great skills. Thank you, thank you. Criticize your boss within the first five minutes of the presentation. Um, but beyond that, with really virtual communities. And I think sometimes this is where there is a generational mistrust that can happen. Um, full disclosure, I'm actually Gen Z, I'm not a millennial. So there can be a, this misunderstanding or like, oh, it's just fluff. I don't understand. Why are they trusting what the other person is saying on the internet? I don't understand. Because we didn't grow up with it. It was not a traditional source of news or information for us. And yet, for every generation below us, it is. All right, so what are the platforms? We've got lots of symbols and colors. We've got Facebook, we've got Twitter, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, and WhatsApp. Now, some of you may know each of these, some of you may know none of them. Oh, lest I forget, I talk. But whether you know them or not, 82% of Americans use at least one of these. 
actively. And in fact, the average American uses three of these platforms. But I think, again, going back to kind of some of the myths, particularly in my generation and above, is that it's just kids that use this. this why are we even talking about this? You know, the majority of my patients aren't pediatrics. Um, well, that's just not true. In fact, 69% of Americans over the age of 50 use at least one platform regularly. And actually, the latest numbers on 65 plus, because that's one of the fastest growing demographics with social media, it's almost 50% now. Again, at least half your patients, depending upon your specialty, are using it. Okay, but they're all the same. Like, why are there so many? I don't understand, they're all the same. Well, not really. And we'll dive into this a little bit more coming up, but people use different platforms for different things. Here's just an example of the top reasons why people use each of these platforms. And you can see there are some pretty big differences. In other words, 77% of people using Instagram are using it to view videos, or excuse me, view photos, whereas with Twitter, 56% of people are using it for news. That being said, not only are people using these platforms differently, but different people are using these platforms differently. There are demographic differences in who's using each of these platforms. And again, this is important to know for really two reasons. One is, again, understanding your patient population, what are they looking at? Where are they getting their information? And then additionally, if you do decide to participate, where should you participate? What's your audience? A lot of that depends on becoming familiar with some of these demographics. We're gonna spend a couple minutes just walk through really the most popular, most used platforms, starting with the biggest, Facebook. Created in 2004 by a college student and is originally intended for college students to remain connected to their friends from high school. It was a way to create a profile, you register yourself as a user, and then you could post updates, post pictures, find your other friends from high school, link with them. All of a sudden now you, you log on and on your news feed or that main page, pictures from your high school friends would pop up. It was a way to stay in touch in a whole new way beyond just email or phones. And everybody's using it. 2.8 billion users actively every month. Again, almost 70% of Americans use Facebook with over 230 million active users every month. And 35% of those are over the age of 45. So again, this is not just young kids that are using it. And it is not just some silly little app, although it is, if you think that, but that silly little app generates over $117 billion every year. YouTube was created the year following in 2005. It's a free video sharing website, unlike Facebook where you have to register, you have to create a profile, you do not have to do that for YouTube. Although if you do choose to have it, then you can start to comment, subscribe to channels, meaning that you like a person's content, so then when they post something new, it gets pushed to you, so it's easy to watch and see their new stuff. Um, you can also upload and share your own user-created videos. The second most visited website in the world is extremely, extremely <laughs> um, well-resourced because in addition to that, not only is it the second most visited website in the world, it is the second largest search engine besides and behind Google. In fact, five billion videos are watched every day and it reaches 95% of any adult over the age of 18 who is over, excuse me, over the age of 35 who is online, which if you look at the latest data, approximately 90% of adults over the age of 35 are online. So you're talking about a huge amount of distribution and population that this platform reaches. And again, similar to Facebook, the fastest growing demographics are in the 35 plus and 55 plus age. Twitter, next year, found in 2006. It's also a little bit different. You do have to also create a profile, become a user, and it limits what you can say. It actually started out at 140 character messages, then got doubled to 280. And then as a registered user, you can 
create, you can write, you can read, you can like, you can retweet, meaning you see something that someone else likes, you push a little button and that then amplifies it to your audience. But the other thing where we see a lot of use in this and particularly in, from a career standpoint, are the hashtag or pound symbols, depending upon what year you were born, um, where when you attach that to a topic, then people can go into Twitter and search it. So for instance, at our national organizations, American College of Surgeons meeting, there will be a hashtag for ACS Clinical Congress. If you aren't there or you are there, you want to follow the content, you can put that in the, the search bar every day and you can see what's going on. You can see who's presenting, what abstracts are going on. And it's just a great way to use even beyond a personal, uh, personal reason. And again, like we said before, you can interact with other users. Going back to, again, this concept of community. Facebook, it started out really just to maintain contact with people that you no longer have daily contact with. You have YouTube, where sure, you can just go online and watch, but then you can go beyond that. And you can start to interact with other users, and same thing with Twitter. Over 217 average million daily users. The average age is 39, so this is, is an older um, median age of user as compared to Instagram or TikTok, for instance. And the average number of followers, 707, but if you actually take out all the accounts that have over 1 million followers, the averages are in the 400s. And there are about 2% of accounts with followers over 1,000. Over 500 million tweets are generated per day. This is heavily used by businesses with over two thirds of businesses having a Twitter account if they have 100 employees or more. It is the number one platform, for better or for worse, for governmental leaders with 83% of global leaders having a Twitter account and using it to communicate. 70% of users are reading the news. And it's not surprising that 25% of the verified accounts, so these are people that Twitter has said yes, you get the little blue check, we know who you are, you are who you say you are. Doesn't mean that they are ascribing to your content, but they're saying that we have verified you from a personal level, security level. 25% of them are journalists. So it's interesting actually, when Captain Sully landed the plane, this actually is when Twitter really took off. Twitter had not been around for that long, but that's because the very first images, the very first video, the very first photos of the incident came on Twitter. And so then it started this concept of, oh, user-generated content might be better or more diverse or quicker than our traditional ABC, CBS, Fox News, you know, your traditional media outlets. And so this then led to more and more journalists becoming part of Twitter. And during the elections, it became one of the top news sources for campaign news as well as election results. Instagram, founded in 2010. It's a free photo and video sharing app. Similar to Twitter and Facebook, you do have to create a profile. And then again, it allows you to interact. You can keep your account private, so only people that you know are able to see your content, or you can have it public but you can interact with other users by following, liking, private messaging, commenting on other people's photos, videos, as well as posting your own. Over 2 billion active users. So you start to see a theme. Facebook has over 2 billion. YouTube is over 2 billion. Instagram is over 2 billion. That being said, the demographics are a little bit different here. Whereas the average age of Twitter users, 39, 64% or the vast majority of people using Instagram are under the age of 34. There are over 100 million photos uploaded, uploaded every day and greater than 25 million businesses that use Instagram to promote their products. Not for a silly reason, and in fact that if you look at the data, 83% of all Instagram users discover new products and services using Instagram. Although the purpose right, is to share photos, look at other people's photos that you like, the organic nature of it has lent itself to, oh, what is that person using? What is that person wearing? Where can I get it? And so it's become a huge business. And similar to Twitter, you can also use the pound or the hashtag to then label or direct your searches to generate content for you. Cool. 
So what does any of this have to do with medicine? Well, we know even before really the takeoff of social media, in fact, this is Katie Couric, this is from 2003. Um, some of you may not know, but she was a morning show host, very popular. Her husband died at the age of 42, secondary to colon cancer. And following this, she took it upon herself to go live on the Today Show and undergo a colonoscopy. And it had a measurable effect in higher number of colonoscopies were performed. And this was actually sustained for a period of nine months after this aired. Because it gave people an insight into a procedure that is very, can be very anxiety inducing, anxiety provoking, that they've never seen before. And this is before YouTube, right? It's not like they could just hop on and see someone else going through it. This really broke a ton of ground for people to say, okay, I know what it looks like. She tolerated it. Maybe it's not so bad. Angelina, Angelina Jolie, famous for not only her right leg, but also her 2013 op-ed, op where she talks about being diagnosed with BRCA1 and undergoing a risk-reducing bilateral mastectomy and her choice and why she made it. Similar to the Katie Couric effect, we saw an Angelina Jolie effect. Increased rise in internet searches. We're now 10 years after the Katie Couric episode. We now have social media. But overall, if you think about it, every single internet search is raising public awareness. It is increasing education for someone who didn't know about hereditary breast cancer, potentially, or what the options are, or what or how often they should be screened, who maybe never go to the physician, never go to a physician or to their doctor. So overall raised public awareness. And in fact, in the UK and the NHS, it overall greatly increased the number of referrals to breast cancer specialists. There's an increase in BRCA testing. There are some different varying thoughts on how helpful that is or was during that period. But at the same time, you get this sense and you get this understanding that it opened the door to people on something that they had not really gotten a sense of what it was, what it meant, and this made it something they could talk about, something they could look into. And even beyond that, there was an increase in the number of contralateral risk-reducing mastectomies that were being performed. Now on the flip side, two great stories, two celebrities who helped public health by being open about their own journeys and challenges. So I don't know how many of you know this individual. This is George Best. If anyone is a UK football fan, meaning not University of Kentucky or American football, but soccer, as we like to call it, this was really kind of the first UK footballer celebrity. Um, he played for Manchester City, United. I don't know if I messed that up. The worst part is I've, I've, I've been to Manchester and um, into that museum. Anyways, <clears throat> moving on. We're surprised. I know. Thank you. Um, but he really was in this area, the era, the very first kind of footballer celebrity. He was out in public. He had the girls. He was partying. He had, um, you know, all the attention. He was on magazine covers. He was in G2, even all the way up to 2008 very well known. And during this, though, he had a very public life, a very public relationship with alcohol and became an alcoholic. In fact, one of his famous quotations was in 1969, I decided to give up girls and liquor. It was the worst 20 minutes of my life. <laughs> and so this was kind of his, this was his persona. This was, this was who he was. Well, he became an alcoholic. He went into liver failure and he needed a liver transplant. He then, after his liver transplant, had a very public return to drinking. Was photographed drinking, was photographed being drunk, in fact, got a DUI after having a liver transplant. So, not only was there a measurable decrease in the number of organ donors in the United Kingdom, but his transplant surgeon went public and actually said that alcohol abusers should not get transplants. This created a huge incident in the UK, and they have taken years and years to try and get back the public's trust 
and how their loved one's organs are going to be used. All right, so that's traditional media. Okay, well, you know, that's got the reach of ABC and CBS and all that good stuff, but let's focus a little bit more on social media. And I think the Ice Bucket Challenge is really one of the first social, purely social media-driven challenges that intersected with medicine. It was in summer of 2014, and it raised over $140 million for ALS research. In the sense of 67% of that went for research, 20% went for patient and community services, 9% for public and professional education, and 2% for fundraising. But what I would love to see, and we don't have that yet, is I would just love to see how many of the public actually even knew what ALS was. Again, we're talking about public health, public education, through something as silly as pouring cold water on each other. That being said, this is one of the headlines from the New York Times, and in fact, over three genes have now been identified and they are working on targeted medications and targeted treatments for these genes from money from the Ice Bucket Challenge. So whether people thought it was silly or not, people thought it was dumb, it was everywhere, everyone's pouring ice water on each other, this isn't silly. This is gonna make a difference in people's lives. All right, so that's still all kind of public, that's just funny stuff. What does it really have to do with inside my office, inside my clinic, inside my operating room? Well, as I think all of us have experienced at some point, everyone's gone to medical school. Might be the Google School of Medicine. But the point is, is that this information is out there. And in fact, 81% of Americans look for health-related information every year. The vast majority of people need health information at some point in time in their lives, whether it's for themselves or for their, <coughs> for their loved ones. And this happens on a regular basis. And 74% of Americans use the internet for healthcare knowledge and advice. I like the fact that 56%, the most widely used website is WebMD, but 31% is Wikipedia, 17% Facebook, 15% YouTube. And quite frankly, these numbers are from more than five years ago. I can pretty much guarantee those have doubled. We just don't have the numbers for you to be specific. But the thing is, is that Oh look, they look at a medical information website more than they talk to us. So whether you embrace social media or not, whether you think it's silly or not, the bottom line is you need to have some familiarity because this is what your patients are using. So, okay, so they're using it. Well, but the thing is, is that they're not just using it to figure out diagnoses, treatments, possible strategies for management of their disease, they're also looking at it for a specific doctor. In fact, 40% of people say that what they find on social media or don't find can help them decide who they're going to see. And to go back, actually, over 40% also say it specifically impacts their decision. In other words, whether they're going to have surgery with you or not, whether they're going to proceed with chemo or not. I think one thing that we have seen, we don't have a lot of literature yet that's going to be coming, but the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the public's relationship with us, how much they trust us, a lot of this has changed significantly. So this data is from before all of that. So you can imagine now, right? How many times have we talked about vaccines? Look at vaccine uptakes. So again, people are making their decisions based on the information that's out there. If your patient has cancer or a chronic disease, breast cancer in particular, there's over 620 breast cancer groups that are online. Going back to this sense of community, People are finding their community and trying to find other people whose lives might look a little bit like theirs, who their struggles might look a little bit like theirs. They're trying to learn from people who have been through similar things, similar treatments, similar surgeries. And in fact, over one third of patients with a chronic medical condition are a part of an online community. Now this last bullet point always makes half my, um, Gen Zers and above twinge, but 
90% of our young adults trust the medical information shared by their friends in these networks, okay? And what I always have to explain to people is that might be a friend that they've never met. That might be a friend they've never seen. The definition of friend isn't someone that they went to school with and hung out with all the time. It is someone that they interact with on the internet in these communities that they feel like understands a bit of their life maybe in a way more so than what we do. So with this collision, really, this explosion of social media, medical information, the internet, everything, this statement came out of Mayo. October 2016, they published kind of a consensus paper on their thoughts and attitudes towards social media. And what they say is the moral and societal duty of an academic healthcare provider is to advance science, improve the care of his or her patients, and share knowledge. A very important part of this role requires physicians. Some say suggests, some say you should think about. Requires physicians to participate in public debates, responsibly influence opinion, and help our patients navigate the complexities of healthcare. Participate in public debate. One of the big comments or pushbacks I get is like, well, there's so much bad information out there. Absolutely. There's some horrible information out there. But your choice is to either leave only bad information out or add what you can to the good information side of that scale. And that's to me what that portion of this statement is referring to. The responsibly influenced opinion we all saw some good and some bad things with COVID, with physicians versus healthcare providers not being responsible. And in fact, we'll go into a couple of examples moving forward. And help our patients navigate the complexities of healthcare. Yes, sometimes that means helping our patients navigate which parking lot they need to use and which building. But it goes beyond that, and that the complexities of them navigating healthcare might be them navigating these online community groups. The information that they are reading about so-and-so who got this chemotherapy regimen or this surgery and helping them understand where they are in their journey and using online support groups in a responsible manner for themselves, something that's healthy for them. And organizations have taken notice of this. In fact, 94% of hospitals have a Facebook account, 64% for Twitter. Residency programs, we don't have really recent data uh, cumulatively, if you look at emergency medicine programs, in particular, their Twitter rate is much higher than 45%, but cumulatively, 45% for Twitter, 46% of Instagram. And this really became more important and highlighted the need for this with COVID. Because all of a sudden, we became in an era of Zoom. Before, when you went to a residency program, you got to interview in person, you got to meet people. Right, 80% of communication is nonverbal. If you're able to get a sense or a feel of a program, well, all of a sudden that's not there. So social media became a way for residency programs and for applicants to try to get to know each other in an era where they weren't allowed to meet in person. 99% of United States medical students use social media for educational networking purposes. 62% use social media to research programs. 53% follow prospective residency programs. And 89% are influenced in some way, positive or negative, by these accounts, by what they're seeing. They're trying to get a sense of the culture. Are they gonna fit in here? What's important, what's valuable to this program? And does that align with my values and what I think is important? And in fact, this influence goes all the way from deciding where they're gonna interview to how they're gonna rank. But it's not just for trainees. In fact, 65% of physicians use social media professionally. It's approximately one third using it for networking. And almost 25% use social media daily for medical purposes, whether that's for being a part of, again, online communities. There's an international hernia collaboration group, it's on Facebook. 
And I forget the latest, but it's got thousands of members from all over the world. And they post tough cases. They ask each other questions. HIPAA compliant. Um, but they're able to engage with other people, not just for networking purposes, but for also medical information and medical education. And to focus a little bit on that, as I mentioned, the International Hernia Collaboration, like I said, that's a group on Facebook. It's just one of the most successful Facebook groups for physicians. The specialty of MIS lends itself well to social media in that there's a camera and they can record what they're doing. Although there is a <clears throat> surgeon in the United Kingdom who does like to wear his GoPro for traumas. Well, not name names. Um, but in 2018, over 2,000 healthcare providers had at least 300 followers. So again, we start looking at the demographics and you start looking at why people use different platforms, but are kind of shaped out or sifted out to be one that people in medicine were using. Again, it's an older demographic, so it's more in line with people who are in medical school, residency, and after. And secondly, people are using it for more serious reasons. Viewing news, having businesses on there, advertising their services as well. And it's really transformed research. I can't say this enough. Research used to be a complete pull phenomenon, meaning you had to have interest, you had to go to a website, you had to type something in and look specifically for something to pull it from somewhere to find it. And it's really changed it to a push phenomenon. Because as we've talked about, Social media is a part of people's workflows. Pull it out, whether you're walking, you're waiting on an elevator, you're waiting for anesthesia, um, <clears throat> whichever. Um, but it's part of your workflow already, right? You're not doing something extra. You're not necessarily seeking out information, but you are in a sense. So now all of a sudden you're on your Twitter, you're on your Facebook, you follow Journal of the American College of Surgeons, you follow your national organization, and you're getting latest research. You're getting things pushed to you in a way that never was done before. And this increases the size of our community. Instead of being able to just curbside who's at your own curb, now all of a sudden, you're able to talk to colleagues from across state lines and across international borders and you're also increasing the speed of dissemination. This has really changed how we disseminate our research in the sense of you write your manuscript, you submit it, <laughs> dang reviewer two, gives you lots of comments, um, and then it gets published, right? And at some point, you're very excited, you get the print version, or you don't get the print version, you just get the online version, you're really excited. And then that distribution of that depends on who gets that journal, and who picks up that issue, and who's then gonna look at that article. Now all of a sudden we have EPUB ahead of print, because what we're realizing is that people want it now. So we're getting publication online, and then now we've got Twitter accounts. The authors, or the journals themselves, are sending this information out to you over and over again, and the overall exposure to research within medicine has increased. You know, it's along the lines of pics or it didn't happen. At some point, the question is, goes, well, did you tweet it or did you write it? Because, you know, you, you got to do both. Otherwise, it doesn't count. In other words, if you didn't tweet about it, did it happen? And there's actually some evidence for this. We go back to July 2016, so six years ago. Andrew Ibrahim, he's a surgeon at University of Michigan. He's the creative director of the Annals of Surgery. He was the first person to come up with this idea of a visual abstract. So again, we've already shifted our minds. We've shifted the way we do things in that instead of just waiting for something to come out or waiting for that issue to come across our desk, flip to that article, all of a sudden he's on Twitter. He's seeing how these tweets are coming across. He's seeing how surgical congresses, surgical conferences, are using these hashtags to help advertise their conference, to help advertise what's happening in the content and why you should come and why you should be a member. And so he decides to put this in a visual form, which is really contains just pretty much the same information you would have on an abstract, but it puts in a visual summary. Here's an example from this month's JAX. And it has been shown to improve even further the dissemination of research. Because if you 
compare the use of a visual abstract, and this goes the same for a regular, um, any sort of tweet, any sort of post. If you include photo, if you include video, you get higher engagement, you get a higher number of impressions. In fact, you can garner up to eight times more impressions by using a visual abstract or photo versus a traditional just text only tweet. Tweets with images, overall 150% more retweets. Okay, so what does that matter? More people look at it, not making money off of it. So why does this matter? Well, it's more than just, yes, your professional reputation. It's more than just kind of building necessarily your research area of expertise, but pictures are worth citations, which I'm talking about H index which is the number of, it gives you a score basically to see how influential are you in the research that you do? How many citations are you getting off of your papers? Um, that sort of thing. And this is um, from Dr. Varghese, he's a friend of mine out in Utah, and they randomize 112 papers. And independent predictors of getting citations off those papers were if you got randomized to being tweeted, just tweeted along. <coughs> And again, if you got an exposure to a larger number of Twitter followers, so not just being tweeted maybe once or twice by a smaller account, but getting more dissemination, getting more people to look at it, all of a sudden your scores, your alt metrics, which are basically metrics that are alternative compared to just um, how many times has that site, how many times has that article been downloaded or saved, but looking at how many times it's been shared, how many times it's been retweeted, how many impressions, how many people have come across this? And you'll see that overall social media attention was predictive of article citations, which gives your research a higher impact. So hopefully now we're all feeling a little bit like New Year's Eve on 2020. This is great. This is amazing. Can't wait to see what comes next. Um, <clears throat> and then 2020 happened. So we're gonna pause for again. It's not all good news, right? A lot of people are using it, have great reasons to use it, but it also can damage your professional image. If you think about it, these things are getting retweeted outside of people that know you. This is public facing information and this information can be used to make hiring decisions and firing decisions. In fact, in a survey of program directors across the country, 40% say that they review the applicant content with a quarter of these saying that that content can impact or has impacted where they have their applicant, whether that's to move them up or to move them down on their match list. And it can be used to make firing decisions. Yes, there are some terribly gross misconduct HIPAA violations that you can see, right? Someone posts a patient's name, someone posts a patient's initials, someone posts a picture with clearly identifying information, but it's actually not just HIPAA violations that can get you into hot water. This first photo on the left, <clears throat> Instagram post by a nurse, completely empty room. No patient identifying information in there. There's no patient name, no birth date, no ID number, but she got fired because this was posted contemporaneously. And it was viewed as insensitive. It was a man who was hit by a subway train in New York, and she posted this after. It's not just HIPAA. In addition to that, this is a nurse on the top um, right of your screen who made a TikTok. This is during the COVID pandemic, and there's music and audio behind it. She's like, when my coworkers find out I still travel, don't wear a mask when I am out and let my kids have play dates. She was fired for violating, at the time, local and state guidelines about mask wearing. Didn't get arrested, right? No one arrested her for not wearing a mask. But the point is, is that you can't just think about, oh, there's no, there's no patient information in this, I'm fine. And in fact, this last one is a group of OBGYN residents at a residency who held up a large uterus and decided to play the Price is Right game 
for Instagram users to then guess how much it weighed. We got in huge trouble for that. Again, viewed as being insensitive. The other thing to keep in mind is all these examples are contemporaneous, right? They're actively in their roles. They're nurses at the time. They're physicians at the time. They're making these errors. There is no statute of limitations. Sarah Collab is, this is all public, public record, was a resident in 2018, to be exact. Back from 2012. She was an intern in 2018. She wasn't even in medical school in 2012. Made anti-Semitic comments on a social media platform. More than one. Not a thousand. She didn't have 10,000 followers. She didn't have, I don't even think, 500 followers. But they were found. Not only was she fired from her first residency, she actually got hired by a second residency when this all broke out. The first residency found out about it, fired her. It wasn't public at that point, however, so a second program <laughs> hired her. It then became very public. It got outed. She got fired again. Not only did she get fired, she had to permanently sign here to surrender her training license to never practice medicine, and for this, it's the state of Ohio ever again. There are real consequences. Again, I have to say, it's the blessing and a curse. You all have grown up with this. And you have grown up with this. We all make mistakes. We all say stupid things. We all do dumb things. Whereas before, the only people that might remember that is your buddy that was with you in high school or college. We didn't have cell phones. There are no pictures of it. Nowadays, youth has an increased level of scrutiny. And that's tough. And it's especially tough when you think about things that you said or did even 10 years prior can get you to lose your job today but it's something to keep in mind. So one thing I like to say, you gotta pause before you post. You gotta think before you tweet. But the first thing is to tell people is double check your why. Even if this is a personal account, even if these are anonymous accounts, I will tell you there have been medical students and residents who have attempted to have anonymous accounts who have been outed publicly on Twitter to their jobs, and I thought they were anonymous. I'll tell you, one thing that I've learned in being involved in social media is there are a lot of people that have a lot more time than we have. They will scrutinize every single photo, every single word, and they will figure out what part of the country you live in, maybe the city where you work, and they will out you. So double check your why. Why are you on the platform? What are your privacy settings for that? Is this purely for your friends and family? Then ensure that it's purely your friends and family. Double check your list, double check your posts. In addition to that, if you're using it for professional reasons, again, are you using this for shock value or are you using this for education? Really, what's the purpose of everything that you post? Because no matter how seemingly small it can be, it can blow up before you know it. In a good way and a bad way. The billboard rule. You don't want it printed on a billboard, put it on social media. So think about it. What would your husband say, your kids say, your colleagues, your boss say if they were to read that tweet? You need to assume that they will. What about your patient? Is that the impression you want them to have of you? I like to call it the Missy Elliott rule. <clears throat> yeah, flip it and reverse it. Come on, help me out. Laugh a little bit. Thank you. Uh, Point being is put yourself in the shoes of the person that could potentially be offended by it. And then think again, is this really that funny? Is this really the message that I wanna get? Am I making sure that I am not presenting myself in any other way than how I want to present myself? Separation of time. I cannot say this enough. You guys are gonna take pictures. You're going to talk about clinical scenarios. Do not do it contemporaneously. Okay? I love seeing photos of our amazing residents operating. I think it's great. I think especially in surgery. Highlight an encouraging diversity. 
which is hugely important as we know it is it improves patient outcomes, right? That being said, if you're gonna post a picture of yourself operating or on call with your team, please post it a week, a month, a few months later as a compilation. <laughs> and the reason is, is because you posted on that day, you don't know who else is gonna see it. And that patient's family is like, were you having a party in the OR? You're sitting there taking a selfie? I thought, you know, my loved one has cancer. This diagnosis has destroyed my family. And you're out here having fun. You're pulling out big cancers, taking pictures of it. Guess how big it is? So I'm not saying you can't take pictures. I'm not saying you can't talk about our lives. In fact, I think it's important to talk about our lives and pull back that curtain and show what we do and help improve the public's health. And at the same time, think about it from a privacy standpoint, be smart, <coughs> and like I said, especially if you're using photos, separate some time before you're posting them. Pull out the microscope for those photos. Like I said, a lot of people, a whole lot of time. They will scrutinize every single corner and pixel in that image. Make sure you don't have a corner of a name, a corner of someone, another employee's ID, and they didn't want to be in the picture. All of a sudden, they're going to their work saying, hey, they put a picture of me on the internet, and I didn't want it there. Okay? Clinical scenarios. Clinical scenarios are great. It's how a lot of people learn. It's how we disseminate information, how to garner opinions from experts who have done ten hundreds, thousands of the procedure, seen this diagnosis. Well, like I tell people, if I'm gonna present an image, for instance, I'm gonna change as many details as possible, right? It doesn't have to be that patient. In other words, can I describe the patient as a male instead of a female? Can I say that they're 75 instead of 65? You know, can I say that this is a motor vehicle collision instead of fall from a ladder? So thinking about how you're doing it, where, because you're not really typically asking about this one individual patient. You're asking about disease, a surgery, an image, <coughs> a clinical scenario. You can change all those details. And again, just helps protect yourself. The second rule that I have is never on an inpatient. Last thing you want is anyone accusing you of altering management of a patient based off of a Twitter poll. Never a good idea. And again, lastly, just thinking beyond the name and medical record number. New York Med <clears throat> was produced by ABC, one example. I got sued by a family and the family won. In this show, they have a man that comes into the emergency department, he then dies in the emergency department. They blurred his face, there was no medical record number, but the family recognized the voice. And that was identifying enough. So we talk about identifying tattoos, we talk about all sorts of images, but you gotta think just beyond name and medical record number. You gotta think beyond HIPAA and think, <coughs> Again, if this patient's family saw this, would they be okay with it? Now for our last couple of minutes, just to talk a little bit about my whys, my hows. My whys, not intentional, to say the least. I was actually writing for Huffington Post at the time, and as part of being a contributor to Huffington Post, you had a Twitter profile. And then uh, went under contract with US News World Report. Same thing, part of it. But it really grew from there. And it, although it wasn't intentional, and my why at the beginning was purely just because I was supposed to, as a box to check, I needed it for my author pages. It turned into something more in that I started to think at this point in time about my mission statement. If y'all don't have one, I highly encourage it. I have one short. One line on each role in my life. And my mission statement as a surgeon is to impact the care of trauma patients beyond that of my operating room. Okay? So it should be descriptive, but not prescriptive. In other words, it doesn't say I have to be NIH funded. It doesn't say that I have to have 100 papers a year or operate at the busiest center or operate in a rural center, et cetera. What it's saying is that through research, through community outreach. You can achieve those goals through a variety of ways. And one of those can be participating in discussions like the top, talking about retention sutures. It's actually funny to me sometimes what I'll get tagged in 
And I was like, this is so lame. Like the answer is obvious. And then you get 500 surgeons weighing in from all over the world that all have 500 different opinions. And you learn something, you participate. And again, that public discourse in engaging in other people's learning, engaging exposure to surgeons who may not work at a busy level one trauma center. But on the flip side for me, improving the care of my trauma patients, as we mentioned before, we know that our patients have better outcomes when we have diversity in our field. So as a woman in surgery, if I can help in any way, this is my pen tweet at the bottom. True story, I was picking up my oldest from school. So cute, this little girl comes up to me. I'm in my scrubs, here are my clean scrubs, and start. And uh, two little girls walk up to me, super cute. And they almost, you know, they're kind of looking at me. And they're like, do you work in a hospital? I was like, yeah. And then she looked at me and I loved it. Her very next question was, oh, are you a doctor? I was like, yes, this is preschool class. And then the two little girls are having their own little conversation about the fact that I'm a doctor and a mommy. And the second girl, she looks at me, looks at the first girl and goes, in total disbelief, a doctor and a mommy? Like just, the other girl just simply, hmm, she's a mommy and a doctor because you can be more. And it was just this cute little moment, right? But again, it's to show that representation, to encourage, promote, retain diversity in our field matters. And that can start through a variety of ways. And for me, one of my whys now in participating in social media is for that. There are pros and there are cons. Networking, great. You can pick up the phone. You can call people all across the country. You can get ideas. This became huge for us in the time of COVID at the very beginning. Remember at my last job, one of my partners has uh, lectured a lot internationally and knew a lot of Italian surgeons. Italy was one of the hardest hit countries at the beginning of the pandemic. He was on the phone with them trying to figure out, well, what are you doing? What's working? What's not? Do we intubate early? Do we intubate late? This is how you do it. This is how you crash. These are tips and tricks for how to reduce aerosolization during intubation, chest tube procedures, etc. So this networking can create not just professional opportunities, which it does, but also educational opportunities and helping us in times where literature is not gonna catch up yet. So randomized controlled trial at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all learning at the same time, but helping to decrease that knowledge gap by increasing our communication was huge. And the networking can lead to opportunities. Again, you start getting more well-known in this area, people invite you to a conference, well, guess what? Then the conference gets some advertisement. You get a speaking opportunity. Gives you a chance to practice your skills. Gives you a chance to amplify your research and hopefully lead to, again, further opportunities. Are there cons? Absolutely. Increased scrutiny. It's funny. I mean, I will say this was completely unintentional on my part and gets to a point where you're realizing in a month that in one month, my Twitter can get over 5 million impressions. You start realizing how many people are seeing what you're saying. It can be intimidating. And with that comes people that don't like you, right? Someone once told me, if everyone likes you, there's something wrong with you. But the point being, they're not standing up for who you, who you are, what you believe in. Because the moment you take a stance, someone's going to have an opinion about that stance. That being said, I will tell you as a surgeon, increased scrutiny is part of who we are. What are we doing next? We're scrutinizing ourselves. m and right? So some of this, I think, does have transferable skills towards becoming professionally not just successful, but also healthy. Part of being a surgeon, being able to criticize yourself, and move on at the same time. That's a balance that we have to learn. The next one are assumptions. As a woman in surgery who's on social media, there are definitely assumptions about how serious someone is. I remember one of my favorite um, interactions was a tweet someone sent me, they're like, oh, hey, what's, what's your favorite operation? I responded, it was my favorite operation. An infrarenal cava. Big. 
residents get to sew it, patients dying, and then they're not dying. Great. And I said, stab one to the heart. Same thing. Easy to get to, easy tissue to sew. And you take a patient literally on the brink of death, you get them back quickly. And it's very satisfying as a team and as a, an attending to take your residents through those types of cases. And this um, <clears throat> older male surgeon responded with, LOL, I should have clarified something you've done more than 10 of. LOL, I've done more than 10 before I finished training. Right? And so the thing is, you have to let some of that roll off of you. And what I will tell you is that no matter what you do in life, people are going to make assumptions about you. Whether you're a woman, whether you're a man, whether you're tall, whether you're short, whether you have gray hair, you don't. And so part of it is, again, this transferring those skills and realizing who's important to you, what's important to you, and deciding what matters and what voices you let in. Now what? First things first, we've got to acknowledge the elephant in the room. We cannot anymore ignore the role of social media in medicine, and particularly in our patients' lives. And we need to become familiar enough with it to be able to open the dialogue with our patients. What resources are you using? Have you joined an online group? If you haven't, would you be interested in an online community? Being able and familiar with reliable resources that you can then also provide your patient, because they're going to go looking. And you can either let them find it on their own, or you can help guide them. Beyond that, thinking about maybe participating. Something to think about, whether it's through the department, we do have our own Twitter page, we have an amazing Instagram page as well, as well as just your own personal. There are lots of Facebook groups for every niche in the world you can think of, but helping to find your community. Going through medical school, going through residency, being a surgeon, being a part of medicine can be very stressful. And having a support system is a huge part of being successful, not just professionally, but also personally. And this is one way to do that. And overall, it's just realizing that in order to stay relevant, we have to stay learning, no matter what. I just want to say thank you to everyone, not only for your attention this morning, but also for the warm and amazing welcome. It's never easy to, number one, move across country <clears throat> with two small children. I'm still scarred. Um, but you all have been so welcoming and wonderful. Your reputation is that of an amazing and excellent, strong, historical clinical program that turns out amazing surgeons. And I'm so happy to be a part of it and to see that it is every bit warranted, that reputation. Thank you again. Welcome to any questions. Coleman, a uh, fascinating, great uh, uh, talk. Um, I will uh, emphasize your caution to our uh, <laughs> residents. Uh, uh, I see the, the social media as a double-edged sword. Uh, well, I think it's fine for, for everybody to, to view social media. I think every time you post something on social media, you put yourself at risk for some problem, including ending your career. Uh, so be very judicious about what you post on social media and how you do it, as uh, uh, Dr. Coleman warned you. So most people are very judicious, but uh, you can see that uh, one photo, and, and now, uh, trust me, I get sent these things at every hour of the day and night if, if one of our residents wants to put something on. Most recently, I got sent one that had the you know, the blue marking pen that was written on the patient to mark the site with some initials and deaths written on there. To ask if that was an identifying tattoo or if that was okay to put on social media. You know, <coughs> we're, we're trying to be to help you to be sure that, that uh, no one gets in trouble from doing this. Yet, it's very important that we help to promote our program, what we do, uh, so that people can find us and, and know about it. So I, I uh, approach it cautiously. Um, so my question, Dr. Coleman, yes. should we be uh, viewing and scrutinizing the social media profiles of all the applicants for our residency program before mm -hmm. we uh, accept people into the program? Mm -hmm. 
I think it's a double-edged sword as well. I think at some level, like I've shown you, there are some things you do want to know. Um, when we talked about those anti-Semitic tweets or uh, social media posts, one of them was when she got into medical school, she joked about giving Jewish patients the wrong medication. Joking, right? That's something every residency program would want to know. At the same time, as many of you might remember, uh, Bikini Gate, <laughs> right? Where there was a paper that was published that talked about how wearing bikinis was unprofessional. Yet, males could post shirtless pictures in the gym, and that wasn't deemed unprofessional. So I think, again, we have to look at our biases, and I think we need to be very intentional. That is, if we're going to look, what are we specifically looking for? And what are we going to do with this information? We're going to knowingly omit all of this. We're not going to look at this. We're specifically looking for issues surrounding diversity, racism, sexism, harassment, those sorts of things. And then if it doesn't fall into those categories, we ignore it. And I think that's hard to do, no matter how much you want to say it. So <clears throat> it's a bit of a waffly answer, but I think there are things that you would want to know. And I think we also have to be very careful about our own biases and how we look at patients. I mean, if you even look at some of the information about blinding journal reviews in terms of race and gender, you get different outcomes. They've done studies even of having blinded residency applications, so those with pictures and those without. Letters of recommendations, different words are used for different genders. So I think we have to be very cognizant of the fact that we all have biases. Being cognizant is the first step and towards combating that. Um, and I do think that if you've got residents out there who are potentially posting dangerous information to your patients, you would want to know that. I believe our time, unfortunately, has expired because this would be a fascinating conversation to carry on longer. I want to thank Dr. Coleman for an outstanding uh, grand round. We will take a very brief break.